Hi, Matt. Welcome to the Genetic Genius Podcast. I'm so excited to have you as a guest today. Oh, I'm excited to be on here. Very uh, grateful for uh, spending some time with you to talk about what I've been up to recently. Yeah, that's great. I can't wait to hear myself. And before we like dive deep into the story of talking about addiction and recovery and your amazing app. I would first love to just hear about your story so the listeners can get to know you a little bit better and we can hear about your journey. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, we always, when we talk about recovery, you know, people always want to start at the beginning, you know, and I grew up in a great house, loving parents, you know, the, the topic of substance abuse never really came up, you know, even though there was, there was some alcoholism and, and uh, uh, generational alcoholism mm-hmm. in the family. You know, saw in high school, I was a college athlete, you know, didn't really have a drinking problem at all in college, you know, graduated and went into the corporate world. You know, what's interesting about the corporate world is you are on airplanes, you're sitting in first class, you're doing deals over dinner, right? You're supposed to drink the bourbon and the martinis. And so for me, it was pretty easy to kind of roll into that, that lifestyle. What I didn't under, understand was the anxiety that I grew up with my entire life, you know, pretty, pretty paralyzing anxiety as a kid. Alcohol got rid of that. And so when I got into my mid to late twenties, I realized, I didn't realize at the time, but I was actually turning to alcohol to deal with some of the anxiety in the ways that I had set my life up, you know? And, and so when, you know, I think about emotional sobriety is it, it's, we have to be so aware of the emotions that trigger a response, which first people like me want to naturally reach outside myself to numb it out, which we know that if you're outside of yourself, it's going to numb it out. It has to come from within. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when I think of, of my story, you know, I've, I've had a successful career, you know, I built a company, sold a company and, you know, separated, ended up separating actually from my wife in 2015. At the time, I still didn't really admit that I had a drinking problem. I also had gotten um, addicted on and off to prescription opiates, you know, which is a common theme here in the United States for sure, is I had a surgery done, you know, former athlete had to get a shoulder repaired. They handed me prescription painkillers, whatever, whichever ones they were. And I realized I didn't have to drink anymore if I took those. So there was about three years (laughs) Or I would just take a pill and my wife was happy because she can't smell opiates, you know, you know, mm. and I was in control. And, and so that's, that's another part of my story is, is the fact that, you know, going from alcohol to any prescription medication, it's the same thing as you're trying to change something about the way you feel. And so, you know, that led me to leaving my wife. I left a beautiful four-year-old boy, a four-month-old boy moved out, you know, thought that, you know, I needed to change, didn't want to admit that it was me that needed to change inside. And so that lasted about three years until I finally got spirit. I hit my spiritual rock bottom in December of 2018. My physical rock bottom was actually December of uh, 2015, if you can believe that. And what, when I think of the spirituality side is, is that I was finally tired. I was finally ready to, to, to make a change in my life, not just for myself, but for my sons and the people in my life. And people always ask me, they say, well, Matt, how, how do you get someone to hit bottom? I, I literally get this question weekly, if not sometimes daily from, from loved ones who just don't understand. And unfortunately, the answer is you can't, mm. you, is you can't force somebody. You know, I had a lot of consequences of my drinking. I never got a DUI. I never went to jail, but I had consequences. I had other consequences Mm -hmm. that started to stack up. And it was just a matter of time before something really, really bad was going to happen to me or somebody else. So I ended up checking myself into Betty Ford out here uh, in uh, Palm Springs, California in January, early January of 2018. And that really started my journey. And I think as we kind of progress through this podcast, I'll, I'll give you more insight into the why I started my life like, because uh, as a serial entrepreneur, when I see things that are being done, but being, being done inefficiently, my natural reaction is how can I change that? <laughs> it's not necessarily create something new that the market's right. never seen. It's like, can we just do the same thing, but do it better, right, better. and make it more effective? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
That's great. I love your story. It's really powerful and it's really common, you know, and I think that's the, the commonality can be really helpful to, for people to hear. And I work with a lot of veterans at the uh, farm that I work at and see patients, I see them there as patients and the opioid opiate addiction aspect that you're talking about is so, so common, you know, and it's like there, it's, like you said, it's overrun in our society right now and you can still function <laughs> and I, you know, and I, but I think that the mental aspects and the physical aspects start to deteriorate over time. <laughs> and then that's when people really are like, Oh, there's something going on here. There's a problem that I need to address. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. Is, is, is you, you know, I think the thing is that people, a lot of times there's stigma associated with addiction. Like you have to be mm-hmm. homeless, you have to be have mental health issues you have to be you know struggling 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 it's Mm -hmm. like no there's tons of in my case corporate executives out there Mm -hmm. who are also struggling with substance use physical addiction or even maladaptive behavioral addiction that's impacting their lives and so you know i'm here to say that that it's it's not one size fits all Uh, and addictions everywhere too the more that i get into this field the more i realize is when we start to define addiction as you know when when obsession becomes normal Mm -hmm. that's addiction and Mm -hmm. so we got to look at our day-to-day lives you know exercise workaholism Mm -hmm. ego social media you know you think about these people nowadays who are addicted to facebook or addicted to confrontation on next door right Mm -hmm. is is you're still triggering negative responses and it becomes a dependency so it doesn't have to be an opiate or have to be alcoholism to be right and, and, you know, when we go upstream of physical and maladaptive behavioral addiction and we look at emotional addiction, well, then who doesn't qualify? You know? <laughs> right. I, everybody. I, I spent my entire life <laughs> right, playing for anxiety. You know, mm-hmm. I wake up every morning and I think to myself, OK, how am I going to create anxiety today? I mean, that's kind of sad. That's my subconscious. That's how mm-hmm. I've been wired. So I'm right. having to do a lot of emotional sobriety work to yeah. figure out the why, you know, you know, why do you play for that? And, you know, recovery when you start to see the people who actually make it and you start to see them putting their lives back together and, and you start to see the impact that's having on their friends and family, that's really where the rewards come in. And, and you know, I'll tell you too, is, is that recovery is not just about abstaining from drugs and alcohol. Right. It's actually about creating and transforming into an extraordinary life. And, mm-hmm. and for many people, myself included, I didn't have a definition of what would be extraordinary in my life. I'm still learning what that is. But I know for sure if I pick up a drink or I take another drug, I will not be able to achieve anything extraordinary, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's a lonely, lonely place to be. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's really powerful. You know, moving from that place of recovery into that place of empowerment, you know, and leading an extraordinary life. And I can't wait to talk more about that. Okay, great. So what do you think about, like, are there specific aspects of the brain that are more triggered than other parts of the brain when it comes to addiction? Because I think we're like, you know, here you're speaking about, you know, they're all forms of addiction. So we have sugar, <laughs> which is a big one. Um, we have like junk food, potato chips, exercise, like you said, are there specific parts of the brain that are triggered that you know of when it comes to addiction? I, it's funny, I should get you on with my, my, I have an identical twin brother who's also in recovery. He's an emergency room physician and he does mm. a science of addiction lecture to the, my lifelink tribe probably once a month oh, on nice. that topic. Of, and he gets into the scientific, I call him the textbook stuff. Oh, <laughs> right. I'm like, I don't even know what you mean. Yeah. But what I do know is, is that, you know, the dopamine response that comes from, like you just mentioned, emotional eating, you know, I'm really anxious right now, but if I eat, uh, I eat sugar, if I have an ice cream cone or a cookie, then that'll make me feel better. Mm-hmm. But you know, that that's that's part of the, the sickness, right? Is it actually it's not gonna make you feel better. In fact, you're gonna be tired, all that hit of sugar to you, but but the brain is saying it is. You know, he mm-hmm. does a study where he talks about the different drugs and he shows my brother, he shows, you know, how quickly the brain reacts to dr- certain drugs. And so if you look at like cocaine, for example, it's mm-hmm. like straight up the chart and then right. it quickly dissipates mm-hmm. so the brain wants more you know <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, and, and, and compared to, to other drugs but i think that you know addiction from my standpoint is is really predicated on when people want to numb themselves out to the mm-hmm. things that are happening in their lives whether it's directly happening to them or they perceive it's directly happening to them or to a loved ones mm-hmm. that's when people start to discover numbing, numbing mechanisms and, and, and 
once the brain starts to recognize that, well, when I take this, I feel better, or at least I, or I don't feel at all. Mm -hmm. I want more. I want more. The other thing with the brain, which is a scarier part is, is the the physical dependency and then what the withdrawal effects are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always, I sort of joke about this, but I never went outside of a prescription on my opiates. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, I waited each month to fill my prescription. I, you know, and even though I was taking more than I should, so I would end up about one week out of the month, not having any. Right. I withdrew every week. I withdrew one week a month for five years. And physical withdrawal from opiates. I mean, it's wow. pretty bad flu-like symptoms. So imagine yeah. what that's doing on your body. The reason I bring totally. that up is a lot of people don't understand that there's acute withdrawal, but then there's post-acute withdrawal. Mm. And the pause or the post-acute withdrawal syndrome is really what takes people back out into active addiction because they can't handle. So the physical are gone. Mm. It's the mental and the emotional side mm-hmm. that they can't handle. And a lot of that can be uh, curbed by by working on more of the emotional side of recovery like okay let's let's address why right now you think picking up a drink is a good thing. Mm-hmm. you know let's talk through that you know but it turns out you know it turns out you know you haven't addressed trauma from your childhood and that right. you know or, or you you don't feel like you're good enough for for anybody you know and mm-hmm. so you want to numb yourself out so you know the the, the acute and the post acute withdrawal i don't think is 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 necessarily discussed enough, especially in treatment programs. Mm-hmm. And now with the medicated medication assisted treatment, which is such the fad now, right? Is let's, right. let's put everyone, for example, on Suboxone. Yeah. Well, I can tell you with firsthand experience. I mean, I never went on Suboxone, but I know people who have, and they ended up addicted to that, and that ended up taking them down. Right. So yeah. I'm not going to make a comment on whether I agree with that or not. But at the end of the day, we have to remove the mood and mind altering substances from our bodies to just feel again. And those feelings are right. really bad. Mm-hmm. But we know that that if we continue to abuse drugs and alcohol or continue maladaptive behavioral addiction, that the life is not going to get any better. Mm. You know, the consequences will continue to mount up. And it always ends in, in three ways, right? You know, institutionalized, death, or jail. None of those right. are good. Now I ended up <laughs> right. going to an institution. I haven't gone to jail yet and I don't intend to die. <laughs> right. So. Knock, knock on wood, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think what you said about dopamine, well, there's two things I, I were super powerful there. I love what you said about dopamine because those neurotransmitters are so affected by addiction, right? It's like, you know, the Lay's potato chip, you can't eat just one. Well, it's true, <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's uh, that they, that when we have something that triggers that dopamine, it's like our body goes, Ooh, I can't wait to have more of that. <laughs> and there are so many ways that we feel that beast of dopamine you know i mean the list is long and (laughs) i'm sure our listeners are like oh yeah i think i'm feeding that beast right now and then the other thing you said was you know it's really interesting when you said about sugar and having that emotional component because alcohol and other substances break down to that sugar right so it's like you know when we have that people say oh i don't need sugar i have a couple beers or wine or whatever it is you know but that breaks right down into sugar and feeds that sugar addiction over and over again (laughs) yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the uh, the old adage of you know I work out but I'm not losing weight. You know, first thing I say is okay, well, let's look at your diet, but then let's look at your alcohol. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's a because, huge component. Know, <laughs> like my, you know, my body, you know, definitely. I mean, I was a, a heavy drinker for many, many years, and so you know, now not having to consume those calories, you know, it's it's, it's kind of nice to be able to stay in better shape, you know, <laughs> reminded, wake up without the fear of a hangover. Right. You know, we, we, we go to these parties and stuff and I'm, I'm usually the only guy sober mm-hmm. and, you know, by nine o'clock, I'm ready to go. I'm ready right. to go. You're like, bye. To go <laughs> um, but that next morning, you know, I wake up spry and ready to greet the day, you mm-hmm. know, and, and sometimes you know, people, the rest of the team may not be. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's so true. And that's one thing I'm really petite. And that's one thing for me, I'm usually like, I don't really want to drink at parties anyway, because I'm, I don't have a, like a super light tolerance. So I'm always a designated driver and I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. Can we go now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Okay. So when we're talking about those parts of the brain that are affected, how can people then like shift that energy, that kind of like addictive energy into one that's kind of like that more creative aspect instead of kind of the addictive habit? Cause that's, you know, we're, we're talking about maybe you're, I don't know, addicted to running or whatever it is, you know, how do, how can listeners start to shift that energy into a more creative zone? Yeah. So number one is it's the awareness, you know, it's the awareness that this is a problem, you know, mm. I think that the, once you're aware of it, then, then the question is, how do you transform that thinking? You know, 
you, know, you bring up exercise. Exercise. I am still very much an addict when it comes to exercise. You know, some would argue I overexercise, you know, but for me, that's the that's a release. You know, that if I can get my swim in every day or I get a good workout in, that I'm going to feel better. However, you know, as my brother likes to remind me, what if you get injured and you can't do that? Mm -hmm. Then what? Right. So this is where we. This is a fine line of where we have to be really careful on what we're relying on mm -hmm. to keep ourselves feeling better. Right. And, and obviously exercise is better than binge drinking you know, right. uh, or, or abusing prescription pain meds. But exercise can also lead to injury, which could lead to depression, which could lead you right back into a drink. And so this is where it's really important to start looking at ourselves on the inside, mm. saying, why do I feel the way? Like, why do I feel like I need to exercise? Is it, is it because I want to look good? Is it you know, is it because I want to feel good? Is it because I want to be good, right? I mean, what are the reasons that, that I, I reach for that? And if that was gone, what would be the outcome of it? And that's really where the transformational work comes in, which again, pre-rehab, pre during rehab, nobody talks about that stuff. You know, right. people are like, I need to get you to abstain from drugs and alcohol. Okay, then what? <laughs> right. Yeah, what's it? Right? I mean, then what, you know? <laughs> yeah, the, oh, well, the next chapter. <laughs> Yeah, you know, go get a therapist. Well, I don't have the money to get a therapist. Well, go do outpatient for a while. I don't have the money to do. I don't have insurance, right? I mean, there's all these, go get a nutritionist. I don't have the money to get, right? I mean, there's mm -hmm. all the things that get thrown out ad hoc are very expensive. And that's also another big problem in the way our healthcare system treats recovery. You know, right. the they said, hey, if you have means, then you're, then you are able to get treatment. I'm not going to say great treatment, but you're able to get treatment. If you don't have means, then, hey, you're kind of out of luck. And that's, I mean, I've met with a lot of states. I've met, met with a lot of communities over the last uh, two years of my life. Like, and it's really sad when you hear that. Mm. Well, we don't really have a lot of options for people in this, this demographic or if they don't have money or they have insurance. So that kind of gets us into a whole different uh, ball game is that, you know, when you look at emotional sobriety, a lot of that work comes from being able to access that cognitive behavioral therapy, right? right. And in some cases, the dialectic behavioral therapy, you know, the DBT, and, and that's, you know, it's important, you know, we have to change the way we think, you know, it's funny, I was an athlete all my life, and uh, in college, I ended up doing um, an individual sport, I did track and field, and I remember, you know, every time I would get into serious competition, I would watch people who had maybe better skills than me, mm -hmm. but they would, they would do worse, because they let their head get in the game. Right, you know, ninety five percent is is up here. Exactly, and your body will follow what your mind does, mm -hmm. uh, and and so you think about the the power of the human brain and the power that we can do things we didn't think were possible, but we can also paralyze ourselves with that same brain. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think the addict brain actually it's interesting is what made us really good at being addicts when we apply it in positive reference. We can be very good at anything. We can start mm. a global sober tribe. We can be get put our families back together, which is what I've done. You know, mm -hmm. we can coach little league and high school track, and you know, we can be of service to others. We can do a tons of things in our our sober life because of this obsessive brain. You know, mm. this, this addict brain where it's like if I focus on something, I'm going to do it really, really well and as hard as I can. You know, right? So, so you can, it's leverageable. Mm -hmm, totally. So it sounds like it's like a, it's like a refocus. And when you're in that state of recovery or sobriety, you, you maybe you, that's more clear, like the clarity kind of comes into play more. It's not so much of a, a haze, so to speak. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely clarity. You know, I, I, it's funny when I, when I, I go on the news a lot here down in Southern California and, and they always ask you, how's life been and everything. I said, well, you know, my, my last drink was November 30th of 2017. And I could tell you, and then I went through treatment in January of that next year, I look at the, the, my life based on my camera roll, which I know sounds kind of silly, but mm -hmm. <laughs> what I've been able to experience with others as a result of me getting sober and staying sober, you can't put a price on that. You know, mm -hmm. those memories don't exist if I hadn't have put the drug on the drug down, right? I mean, they just don't. And I don't know where right. I would be. I may not even be alive anymore. You know, that's right. kind of a, a thought, you know, the way I was going, you know, that's probably, probably could have been true. And so you think about what we're able to do with a clear mind. That doesn't mean we're not going to have good days and bad days. I mean, right. it's like, I mean, I have bad <laughs> weeks, bad hours. I mean, <laughs> fatigue issues. And I'm like, oh man, wouldn't it be nice? It's like, right. So 
we're humans, you, you know, that the society seems to think, and I used to think that we're supposed to have this high all the time. Mm. Like there's not supposed to be an equilibrium of good and bad, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, what do you mean? I'm not feeling good all the time. Well, here, right. take this pill. You will. Oh, okay, cool. I'll take it. Well, now I'm not feeling good anymore. Okay. Take another one. Right. right. So we're always reaching for things outside of ourselves to try to lift up our mood. Mm. And, and in reality, look, if you're fatigued, take a nap. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Out. Yeah. Go it, be out know. in the sunshine or something. <laughs> right. Go for a walk, you know, mm-hmm. go down to the beach, you know, where I live here. Drink you some know? water. <laughs> yeah. Don't, yeah. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't wallow in the self-pity of not feeling good. And, and, you know, that doesn't mean that there aren't reasons to have, you know, medications for things like depression, right. and anxiety, mm-hmm. those things, look, those things exist. And I would never make a statement saying that you don't need those. I will tell you though, I know a lot of people that once they got sober, they got off their meds right. and their life was pretty good. So, you know, that's always a, a possibility. I think in mainstream medicine, you know, the prescription pad is the first thing that comes out, you know, you think of these primary care doctors, mm-hmm. they have to see hundreds of patients more than they used to just to make the same amount of money that they did 15, 20 years ago. And what happens if you don't have personalized healthcare, right? It's like, okay, right. I got Matt here. He's in my office. If I can get him out in five minutes, then I'll get caught back up on my overloaded schedule. So what right. do you need? Okay. You need opiate oh, shoulder pain. Okay, cool. What else? You know, yeah. and it's like, scary you know whereas when i got into naturopathy when i finally got referred to a naturopath through a Mm -hmm. friend of mine who's actually in recovery the whole conversation changed Mm. it wasn't like what do you need it's like well let's do a baseline assessment of labs right and i told him i said well i I already do labs well no 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 more than that i want to look at micronutrients i want to look Mm -hmm. at hormones i want to look at all of these other things and i'm like well nobody's asked about that right of course (laughs) so he runs all these labs and guess what shocker (laughs) <laughs> I've got all kinds of issues going on from adrenals to, to testosterone to, to gut <laughs> to everything. Right. And, and, and so, you know, you're, that's the other thing that we have to remember is that when we're abusing our bodies with drugs and alcohol, you know, we're, we're losing the equilibrium, the homeostasis in our bodies. And, and, and you can't just assume that just by getting sober, is going to make you feel right. You know, this is, again, you go back to the affordability and access to care. It's hard, you know, is that naturopaths are not covered under insurance. At least right. not, not where I'm from, mm-hmm. you know, lab work is expensive, you know, mm-hmm. and so who has the means to be able to go and get these based on? Right. Uh, but you see, you know, are there other factors that are making you feel bad that has not, that, that aren't just your brain? You right, know, yeah, exactly. Physical. So for me, falling asleep at 10 o'clock in the morning is a, what I thought was a healthy, you know, 39 year old male four, four years ago. That's right. not normal. No, right. <laughs> yeah. Your adrenals were whacked out. Cortisol. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, mean, I still probably, you know, struggle with, with that. You know, I work hard at, you know, work out hard. And so I have to be careful, but I do take supplements for adrenals and, mm-hmm. and cortisol and, and L-glutamine and, and some of the other things that can kind of help. In fact, my acupuncture is, is really who got me on a, a nice low regime there. Nice. To look at, you know, uh, gut health, mm-hmm. to look at, you know, energy, to look at calm, calming, you know, mood. Mm-hmm. I think the, the meditation has been a big thing too. I uh, mm-hmm. probably could do more of it, but when you think about just having a reset throughout the day, when you're feeling anxious, you know, take those five minutes and just, just sit, sit for a second, you know, turn yeah. everything off. So, you know, it's, we have enough craziness in this world addicted to our smartphones and, and all of those things. You know, it's actually funny. I started uh, <laughs> doing stuff that a few months ago, I'm sure people on the weekends don't like this, but I actually <laughs> put my phone away. Oh yeah, um, me too. I, I don't bring it with me and I don't. Right. And, and it's been interesting to see people who are like, you know, when you finally look at it again Sunday night, you got all these text messages. Right. Question mark, where are you, whatever. And it's like, I thought you <laughs> understand. Like, I don't, unless it's emergency, even if it is emergency, I'm like, I'm not going to be available. Like, like it, mm-hmm. I need to have some time where I'm focused on the people around me in mm-hmm. person, physically, right? Not right. not tethered to my phone. I mean, go walk down the street, and especially look at these younger generations. They're going to have neck problems because I mean, mm-hmm. I was literally driving to the gym this morning and I see three teenagers walking across the street and they're all like this. They're walking across the street, not talking <laughs> right. to each other. And they're right. all on those phones. I don't know what they were looking at. <laughs> TikTok. Right. Mm-hmm. Probably so something. We've got to be prepared for this next generation now that's mm-hmm. growing up. That's going to have a whole different slew of addictions that are coming out. Right. I've got two young boys. I got a 10 year old and a seven year old. 
<laughs> screen time, you right, know, you take a, a whole screen different concept. away from a <laughs> seven-year-old, you know, he goes into a, a fit of rage, which is equivalent of taking a, a bottle of vodka away from an alcoholic, you know, I mean, right. it's the same reaction. Same reaction. It's mm-hmm. the same reaction. Yeah, those, yeah, those are right on point because I think it's really important for us to see that there's lots of different aspects that can affect us. And especially when you're talking about, you know, having that calm, I love how you talked about the meditation, having those pieces that you can bring in to help your body to recover daily, (laughs) you know, you got to have those pieces. And, and, you know, it's interesting what you're saying about turning off your phone. I recently decided I'm going to turn off all notifications on my phone because I would get like stuff from patients and, you know, this is nonstop. So I did that and I'm like a whole new person. (laughs) I'm like, Oh, I can just have my phone there and it doesn't tell me anything. (laughs) I don't need, I don't need it to tell me what to do. (laughs) I'm my own person. So that was a life changer. And I did that right before I went on vacation to the coast and I was like, you know, what I'm going to do this. And I haven't turned it back on. And I'm like, I don't need to respond instantaneously to yeah. this situation. If it's a dire emergency, someone will figure it out. <laughs> well, and that's the thing is that, you know, I think we, we think we're so important and that, you know, what it's, it's kind of like the old vacation. Yeah. You go on vacation, you come back, the same problems are there, you know, right. nothing, <laughs> nothing dramatic happened. Yeah. People will have to, to be more reliant on, on solving problems on their own. And and I think that, that I love that you turn off notifications. I mean, you think about, I mean, we could literally be inundated between our smartwatches and our phones. It's right. like, and what does that do that creates anxiety? Yeah, so it does. A guy like me who mm-hmm. spent his whole life playing for anxiety, the stress of that, you know, starts to even add to the anxiety. You know, and then mm-hmm. what I've noticed recently, I'm much more body aware and, and emotionally aware, especially being sober, is how my anxiety and, uh, drives fatigue. You know, I said, I'll sit there and say, geez, I'm really exhausted right now. I must mm-hmm. be sick. I said, you know what? I'm super anxious. Right. And so it drains your body. You know, it mm-hmm. drains the anxiety and the, the what ifs. And, and again, for me, five years ago, you know, I would turn to a drink or a drug. And, and then I didn't mm-hmm. have to worry about those things because I was focused on, on feeling good. Right. You know, and, and, and that's how I lived my life for many, many years. Now being sober, you got to address those things. But you also have to address them head <laughs> on too. Right. And you have to know where to, where to carve the, the stuff out that's just noise. You know, I know yeah. before we started the podcast, we were joking about our to-do list. <laughs> a lot of the stuff's noise. I mean, 80% mm-hmm. of the things on my desk right now are noise. I need to just, you know, move that along, you know. Right, prioritize. Like, <laughs> yep. And that's, mm-hmm. I think that's another another life skill that that we, we start to learn when we focus on the emotional reasons that we want to numb ourselves out, kind of to your, your, your earlier question, is how do we set our life up to either play for hope and play for transformation Mm. or play for anxiety and play for fear and play for not being good enough right i mean it's Mm. our choice right it's not your choice it's it's my choice you know Mm. it's also the way that we interpret ourselves with the outside world i mean you could say something to me right now that could be insulting well you just said you said what you said okay well right i'm the one that had an emotional response of feeling oh man that was really mean was Mm. it Mm. you said what you said Mm-hmm. And, and so there's also ways in which we have to start to learn to interact with the outside world to make sure that we don't trigger some of that negative thinking, which right. then obviously as an addict can turn to the rationale to, to drink and use drugs uh, again. So mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of complexity here. Right. You know? Yeah, totally. Okay. Let's switch it. I wanted to ask you kind of about it's a couple things about genetics. So what do you, what impact do you think that you're like, first of all, you, you don't, I don't, I'm not asking you to talk if you've had your genetic profile done and explain it all. <laughs> we don't need to go there, but do you think that your genetics have played a role in your addiction? And did you, you know, see any of that? Like, is there a hereditary background, your own cellular DNA makeup, like ancestral DNA? Did you see that play a role in anything that was going on with you personally? Yeah, uh, great question. And the answer is affirmative. Yes, uh, I do absolutely believe that this is a genetic plague. A couple of reasons. One, when I now actually look at our family tree, both sides, mom and dad, not only do we have the depression, the bipolar, the suicide, but we also have the substance abuse, you know, mm-hmm. mainly alcoholism. Mm-hmm. And it goes back generation and generation and generation. Mm-hmm. Different varying degrees, high functioning, low right. functioning, you know, but yes, it does. And then, you know, look at my, my uh, I have an identical twin and he's very public about his recovery. He's a, he's a great physician, lives back east. 
but I mean, we both, nobody, nobody in a million years would have thought the Seafoam brothers would have ended up as addicts, right? Mm-hmm. We were all American kids. We were smart in school. We went to good colleges. We played sports, you know, uh, all those things. Well, guess what? We do. Right. And so when you start to think about, about that piece, the other reason is, uh, is when people onboarded the app, they have the opportunity to share some data with, um, with the tribe. I mean, that's mm-hmm. one way that we mm-hmm. match people, right? If I want to find people that I can relate to beyond just I'm an alcoholic, Right. Um, we allow people if they want to, to share some data and it's structured data. So I actually look and I have a family history section. Mm. You know that, that I almost never see someone only check one person in that. Mm. Most people are checking family history of mother, father, right. uncle, grandparent, sibling, child. Mm-hmm. It's all over the place, you know, when it comes to that. So again, I don't think it's coincidence that, that, that there is a genetic play here when it comes to the predisposition of becoming addicted to things that make us feel better. Right. Yeah, I just don't. I, I really don't. Mm-hmm. Now, now, some of that could be a lot of the mental health side. So like on my, my family, especially on my mom's side, mental health was a major factor with her mother, brother, you know, and I'm sure if we were to go back further along that tree, right, along the tree. <laughs> but nobody talked about it too. We got to remember that, you know, right. But nobody, I mean, 10 years ago, nobody wanted to talk about this, this topic. Right. Yeah. It's it not like until taboo. recently. It's taboo. It's like, <laughs> right. oh God, the alcoholic. Well, he right. goes Don't to talk the about that. Church <laughs> an AA meeting and, you know, stay <laughs> away from him. Yeah. Right. Now, I mean, look at the, look at the influencers out there that have come clean that they've been sober for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Right. Or they've just recently gotten sober or mm-hmm. they just recently have recognized they have a problem. This is not a, this disease is, is, is gaining in popularity when it comes to it's okay to be sober it's okay to talk mm-hmm. about this stuff right and that's the one thing about my life link was I, I i couldn't believe that i could get out of an inpatient treatment program which i had to spend a lot of money to go through mm-hmm. and there's no community out there like there, like, all you, i got a piece of paper and it had a guy's name on it i'm literally it was bob f and and a phone and number i said to the lady i said who is this oh he's an alumni he lives in san diego and i said okay is he sober and she's like, well, I hope so. And I said, well, what does he do for a living? What kind of hobbies does he like to do? You know, will I be able to relate to this guy? And what she told me was she goes, those are all really good questions. I wish I had the answer to them. And I'm like, wait, yeah. what? <laughs> I can go on match.com and find my ideal spouse. I can go on cars.com and find my ideal car. Right. Why, where's my addicts.com or recovery.com where I can mm-hmm. go match with somebody and say, look, right. I'm looking for business executives who like to surf, who also have a history of mood disorder. Mm. who also have, you know, health issue ABC, mm. you know, who, you know, ha- past trauma, right? Where right. does the war veteran who has PTSD mm-hmm. being treated to VA, who's an alcoholic, find other people in seconds like that? And right. that's what really started my life link was I had to find a better way for people to connect on a much deeper level than just, uh, and I call, I call it precision recovery, but on, on a much deeper level than just, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm mad I'm an alcoholic. Right. Walking into an AA meeting is extremely intimidating. Mm-hmm. Uh, and raising your hand and talking at a meeting is extremely intimidating. And the hope that somebody in that room will relate to you, mm-hmm. that's a hope. A lot of times, one or two people will, but that's a big, that's a big. And so a lot of times people just, they go to a meeting or two and then they stop going because they mm-hmm. don't feel the human connection. And, and yeah. now they have a virtual way or a softer entry into recovery. And I think with COVID too, we've realized that you, you really do need to have your tribe of sober warriors, you know, right. accessible 24 seven on your phone. Yeah. You know? and, and human to human in person is important. You know, we do a lot of in-person meetups throughout the U S you know, but again, with COVID, you know, that was a, that kind of changed the, the playing field on how we stay <laughs> a connected. little bit. Right. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the app, the uh, My Life Link. So the inspiration, it sounds like, was for you when you were coming out of recovery and mm-hmm. like having nothing to relate to, no community to help support you, which how can they, how can we expect people to succeed if there's not a support system? That's like, you know, A plus A plus F. It does not right. compute, right? So how does the app work? So you talked a little bit. So you like log in, you make your, your profile, how to, how, and then you connect it. Can you explain a little bit for our listeners about how, how that works? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've kept it very simple. You know, again, it's a free app. Anyone can use it. Apple play or Apple store, Google play, you know, whatever, whatever your store of choice is based on your device. And, and what we're really trying to do is three things. One is, is that obviously we want the, the human connection piece. We want people to quickly be able to find others like them. 
and they can do that on an individual basis. They can also do it through groups. We have lots of different groups, you know, that, that have been defined already that people can join. But the more important thing is actually it's the reinforcement of the things that we need to be doing every day to stay uh, healthy and also to serve others, which mm. is the emotional side. And so when you, you can track your actions in the app and it's structured, it's not a social media experience. You know, a lot of people get turned <laughs> off because they're like, well, I really want to just post whatever I want and pictures and quotes. And I'm like, okay, well, you can go to Facebook for that. Right. There's You're already come to my life thing. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm never going to be a Facebook. That's not what I want. In fact, that's an addiction in itself. It's totally. <laughs> engage on the, my life. Like, like I just exercise this morning. So I go into the app and I check off exercise. Now the whole mm-hmm. community sees that I exercise. They can comment. I can take a picture of my, my pool or whatever. Right. But, but what's nice is, is it does two things. It reinforces to me that I'm doing things to stay healthy, but it's also showing the tribe some of the things that a guy who's maintained almost four years of sobriety mm-hmm. has actually does in his daily routine, right? Mm-hmm. And, and part of this is education on what we need to be doing in recovery. So whether you're eating healthy, you're praying, you're meditating, you're resting, you're reaching out to others, you're sharing your story, you're complimenting people, you're serving others, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you know, all those things. And then when you have emotions, right, if you're triggered, post it, let us figure that out. Right. If, if, but if you're joyful because you had a great lunch with, with your wife and your children, post that too, because mm-hmm. that inspires the community that, Hey, this could be mine as well. If I can just stay sober. And so it's really that piece. And then we bring a lot of content in. So there's channels and there's podcasts and there's, you know, all kinds of cool, like I'll put our podcast, but we're doing <laughs> right now. I'll have that in one of our channels. Nice. And so people can listen to it and comment and like but it's it's really it's been a, a great experience we just went live with a video chat also so we mm-hmm. have up to 16 people now doing group meetings and and things like that and then we do meet every day we have a my life link sober tribe meet at daily at five pacific and eastern and then we have lots of other meetings that we offer throughout the, the day and the week that are hosted by tribe members on different topics you know like emotional sobriety and nutrition so, some uh, 12 step work for folks that want mm-hmm. to, to do that. So it's, it's been neat to, to see it grow and it's grown organically. You know, I didn't raise any money for this thing. I, I wrote the checks myself and it's, it's been nice to see just the community really kind of grow before we try to do more mm-hmm. of the PR side of it. Because, you know, the last thing I wanted was, you know, you have a 25,000 users sign up, but then nobody uses it, you know, so I'm right. a little bit more disciplined <laughs> on engagement. Mm-hmm. more than just users, you know, as so I want to see people engaging and inspiring each other. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I love the community aspect that you created with it. And so what about with the group setting? So you can, you can join a group or you can then create your own group, depending on mm-hmm. your topic. Like say, I don't know, maybe you wanted to look for foods that help with liver support, <laughs> like that right. a, but something like that. But so then you can create your own and then people yep. can can search in the app and find something that they're looking for that ha- they have in common with other people that are using the app. Absolutely. They, oh, that's yep, cool. you, and the individual can create their own groups. They can make them private or secret or both. Mm-hmm. They can mm-hmm. leave it public and then people can join and then uh, it becomes its own little community around the topic. So like we've got a lot of groups, you know, we actually just had a a family member of alcoholics. Uh, she created a family member of alcoholics group. And mm-hmm. so now you have people who may not be in recovery because they don't have problems, but we have a lot of family members and loved ones who sign up for the app to find other family members and loved ones Mm -hmm. to learn how to cope, you know, with with their spouse or their child or their friend who who is not ready yet to get sober. Like, how do you do those things? And so, Mm -hmm. you know, the group's feature is something we launched uh, at the end of last year, and I've really enjoyed watching it Mm -hmm. grow. It creates a little, a much more... um, creates much more uh, of a centered community around a topic, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so it's, it's been, been fun to, to see. You know, I think too, now that we start looking at, at telehealth and some of the other things that eventually we'll bring into this, this experience, you know, that, that, that'll be a big component too, is it's really, how do you design a cohort of individuals that may need counseling? So if I'm, you know, six months offering some outpatient services mm-hmm. led by a professional, you know, maybe we have a cohort of just, you know, male PTSD war veteran alcoholics mm-hmm. who really work with each other to see how we're going to get this done because that's I think it's really important for folks to know that not one one size does not fit all with addicts you know you could if you put me in a room five years ago with a 
you know, 22 year old who's never had a job, who's been addicted to heroin since he was 14. I'm not going to relate to that individual. The only thing I'm going to relate to is that mm-hmm. you take a dr- an opiate to, to numb yourself out. Right. But if you put me in a group of individuals, you know, that are like me, or for that example, you find other 22 year olds, you know, or generation Xers or Ys, whatever that is, that, that fit that profile and you find one who's figured out a way to happiness and recovery, mm. they can actually pull that whole group over. And that's what wow. creates really the evolution. I, yeah, you know, people ask great. me what my objective is, you know, 95% relapse rate in the first year. And that's, that's mm-hmm. just a terrible statistic. Mm-hmm. And it's probably higher to be honest, you know, yeah, it probably I, is. I sit mm-hmm. there and go, you know, hundred people are telling you right now they're ready to get sober. Only 95, excuse me, only five make it. And, and of those five that wow. make the year, I, I'm guessing only one could say they're built, they've transformed it and they've created an extraordinary life. And mm-hmm. So I'm trying to do two things. I want to get that 95 down mm-hmm. and I want to create more extraordinary moments uh, in people's lives. And it's not me doing it. Now it's the tribe. It's the community. Right. <laughs> you know, two years ago, it was me. Now I have little sober warriors all over the U.S. And frankly, in international too. It's been amazing yeah. to see our international growth. Now. Yeah, and I, I don't know where so folks cool. find it. Maybe social media. <laughs> well, probably, but, you know, it's community. That's how it spreads, right? It's like six degrees of separation, right? Yeah. <laughs> like one person yep. says this. I'm like, oh yeah, did you hear that? <laughs> that's how it yep. spreads <laughs> in yeah, a good way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just to backtrack. So how do healthcare providers use the app to help their clients and patients? So would they download the app themselves and then look for a group or do they recommend the app to their their patient or client? Say like, you know, hey, this is a great app for you to use to work in the community or somebody coming out of a clinic, like you said. How does that work? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so on the acute side, you know, what I, I tell uh, providers is that make sure this is a component to your social work discharge, right? So if somebody gets an uh, overdose, ambulance, nine one one to the ER, stabilized, and now you're ready to move them out don't just hand them their traditional packet, you know, onboard right. them onto a community. In fact, help them join a group, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think that that's a big, big component, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're, you know, you're an emergency room social worker or you're in a primary care clinic is that the, the concept of community and peer to peer support is really the only thing that works in getting sober. And Bill W figured that out back in the thirties with Alcoholics Anonymous and he was right, you know, but mm-hmm. it took him a long time to realize that when you put an addict with an addict, one who's figured it out and one who doesn't know, right. your chance of success is much higher. So mm-hmm. I think that the providers is a big thing. I think the other big uh, component, uh, we started to work with in Ohio, West Virginia, and Kentucky, these quick response teams. And mm. so this is a combination of fire, 911, police, emergency room professionals who are dealing with their case with a lot of these opioid overdoses, right? They get revived and then it's like, what do you do with that individual? So these right. QRPs actually go out to their home and mm-hmm. they try to connect with them and get them into more services. And so they're starting to use the app to actually create groups, their own cohort of people. Mm-hmm. And say, okay, this is how we're going to stay together, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's another feature that, you know, I hadn't thought about the applicability until right. I was like, oh, wow, that actually makes a whole lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, as you it know, evolves. <laughs> you guys could use this as a tool to keep track of your people, make mm-hmm. sure that they're doing the things that, that they should be doing uh, and staying engaged. So I think the, the practitioners, you know, it's... Uh, not a prescription pad anymore you know i think that you know what i've learned in recovery is is there's only some so much truth that will tell a provider but mm-hmm. what's been amazing and, and that obviously is what goes in our medical record or our electronic medical record right when you look at the level of transparency and radical honesty that uh, it that comes out in, in our sober tribe meetings and the mm-hmm. one-on-one it's amazing people mm-hmm. are an open book mm-hmm. you know you can be totally anonymous you do, you can be you know J X whatever it is, you, you can have an avatar. <laughs> right. Most people don't even do that. Most people want to know. They're like they're, they're very proud that they're here. This is mm-hmm. me. This is what I'm about. This is some data, some information on me that that will help you understand who I am beyond just my addiction. And 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 that's been really powerful to see. You know, it's really the 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 community and the support of the community. You know, mm-hmm. I always get asked, you know, have you had any really negative things happen? You know, we launched in the, the summer of 20 i guess it's 2019 now mm-hmm. i can only count on a couple times where there was even something suspicious and that mm-hmm. just also to me is a testament that when you see the app you hear me on the news or you, your friend refers you to it people who download it really want help 
it may be a family member or a loved one who needs help, but it may be the, the person afflicted with addiction needs help. But the bottom line is they need, they want help and they're, and they're mm-hmm. ready. Now the question is, how do we take that moment where they're like, I saw him on the news, for example, I need mm-hmm. this right. and keep you here with us. Right. Yeah. And that's where you get complex. <laughs> right. That's where you got to get into the nutrition and all the things that we've talked about on the podcast. You got to get into the meditation. You got to get into the emotional sobriety work. And so the, the tribe is we're trying to bring in more individuals now to help teach a lot of those skill sets, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I haven't figured out a commercialization to it at all right now. You know, it's just out there for everyone to use. But at the end of the day, I mean, my biggest aspiration is to make sure that people, whether you have money or you don't, can get the services they need to start to put their contracts with their lives on. We have a lot of people that have joined who've been incarcerated. You know, right. uh, we have a lot of people that join that have had a long history of, of domestic violence or sexual assault, right? Mm-hmm. It's a different conversation when you get into that level of trauma or that level of complexity with getting a job, you know, that, that someone like me that didn't experience any of that, like, I can't tell you. I can't be, oh, let me tell you what you should do. Like, right, you can't I don't know what it's like <laughs> to not be able to apply for a job and get one, you know? Right. I don't know what it's like to have been abused by, by a spouse for years, you know? Mm-hmm. But, I, but I guarantee you there's, there's a lot of people in the tribe who exactly that situation that can mm-hmm. help, help you and guide you in ways that, that help them. And that's really what it is, is this reconnecting with life together is our tagline, right? Re- mm-hmm. My life, taking back my life, my link, right? My community. And it's reconnecting together, you know, for us to take back our life and to build out the community. And that's, that's really the, the goal here. Yeah, it's so empowering to have that tool to connect in the community because that's the piece that, and I liked what you said too about, you know, the AA meetings, how it can be so intimidating to be that person when you're going in and like, oh yeah, me. <laughs> but on yeah. the app, you have that little bit of, you know, like a barrier, <laughs> but you can be open or not be open. You can choose how you want to relate. And the support network is so needed in, in so many different arenas. And like you said, with all different types of people experiencing the need and just really not being left hanging anymore, right. you know, having yeah. a community of support. And that's really key. And what about, you mentioned a little bit, you just in a brief moment, <laughs> the precision recovery. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, I mean, it's not, not a technical term. You know, I've been in healthcare. You can uh, say it is. <laughs> 20 years, sounds good. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I hear about precision medicine. Uh, I've worked in a lot of the, I, I worked for a company uh, that did a lot of the genetic sequencing to really look at cancer profiles. And, you know, and we always talk about precision medicine. I'm going to treat right. the individual, not as a cohort of people. And so I started to think to myself, so why do we keep trying to treat addiction recovery as a mm. large cohort of random people? Mm-hmm. Right? Why can't we start to group like individuals together, led by a like leader who's mm-hmm. figure out the pathway? You know, I went to Betty Ford, where I would say, you know, of the 50 or 60 people that were between the two male dorms there, mm-hmm. they're probably related to like five, maybe right. five mm-hmm. or six. What if I was in a rehab, uh, inpatient rehab with 60 people I related to? Wow, that would be so different. Right? It would be, right? Because mm-hmm. now you're talking about the life skills, you know, and, and this is where I think that the, the recovery gets so challenging is, is that, is that we're, we're being thrown together in groups that don't make sense. You right. know, if you're just trying to teach someone to abstain from drugs, and alcohol, I guess you could teach that, but you could run a seminar on that, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> TED talk on that. But if you really want progress, in my opinion, at least, want progress you've got to get much more specific mm-hmm. and, and, and more attributes of that and what makes that person uh, who they are and mm-hmm. that includes their family their history too right which you know again when you look at trauma or you look at uh social determinants today right i mean no job going through a divorce right then incarcerated those are all challenges that, that mm-hmm. are going to even make it more difficult in some yeah, cases more stressful to, to recover mm-hmm. yeah and and so i think that that, that the whole concept of a, a precision recovery needs needs to become paramount if if we're going to see an impact to that 95 percent relapse rate and, and that kind of gets into also the cost of, of ineffective treatment. You know, it's very expensive on health systems. It's expensive on insurance companies. It's expensive on communities to have ineffective recovery treatment. You know? right. and, and, and again, I, I, I will make a statement and say that recovery is ineffective if you define a 95% relapse rate is unacceptable in the mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and there are, I think there are, 
different ways, I don't want to say better, there are different ways and approaches that we can get a better result, which actually will reduce cost and improve lives of the people around that, that individual. Mm-hmm. People forget about the collateral damage sometimes of the addiction. Like, like I had a four-year-old who absolutely remembers the three years that I wasn't really around. I know mm-hmm. my four-month-old really doesn't, like lucky right. for him. Got a, a wife who went through three and a half years without a husband. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got a mom and a dad, you know, I've got, I've got people I used to work with. Right. So, I mean, the collateral damage that we leave is, is material and can be very material. And, and again, if we get more people into recovery and staying in recovery, that starts to heal. Right. And then society starts to heal, you know, exactly. and, and I know that's getting a little more soapboxes, soapbox-ish, <laughs> <laughs> but I got to tell you, I mean, I, I go off of firsthand experience, you know, yeah, I'm a, no, it's true. I'm a society now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have friends who rely on me now, you know, I make commitments and, and for the most part, I'll stick with them. I spend a lot of my time in service work. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. I do. Obviously, LifeLink's a big focus of mine, but youth youth sports coaching, right? I was an athlete all my life, so I love whether I'm coaching seven year old little league or I'm coaching mm-hmm. high school track kids. Is that I have an opportunity now to help guide them beyond just the sport? You know, talk right. about the life skills that they're learning through sports. They're going to make a big difference in their lives. Yeah, you know, and nobody talked about that. Yeah, you know, like when right. I was growing up, <laughs> that wasn't really like a topic. You know, yeah. now, I feel like it it it, it is a topic. Yeah, things have changed a lot, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, they have. And, and yeah. so you know, we want to evolve with the way society is accepting these things. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that you know addiction is becoming more and more prevalent, mm-hmm. uh, and especially as we see this stuff in, in our, our younger generations. And then, you know, the other thing we've got to keep in mind, too, is that, you know, when you start looking at legalization of marijuana and these things, that's telling people that it's okay. But there's mm-hmm. some people that are going to be turning to that chemical to right. deal with the anxiety that they could process through. So, you know, I'm not here to say whether I agree with it or disagree with it. Right. But again, folks, you know, if you're listeners, if you're, if you're reaching outside yourself to change the way you feel, mm-hmm. that's a problem. Yeah. You know, and for people like me that have a genetic disposition for addiction, that's where addiction really takes its hold. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened to me in my 20s by doing deals over bourbon and martinis and on a Thursday night flight home having a cocktail or two. Yeah. I started to, to subconsciously, I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm not quite as worried as I used to be. I'm not mm-hmm. as anxious as I used to be. Mm-hmm. Right. You got to have advice. And, it, and, it, <laughs> and, it, and it, it impacted 10 years of my life, more than 10 years of my life. Yeah. So. Such a powerful story, Matt. I just really appreciate everything that you talked about, like opening yourself up and talking about who you are and your journey, but then also like the amazing app that you've created, which is, I can't wait to share it with my patients and also especially the veteran community that I work with because they, they have, their tools are very limited, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think we work a lot with the VA hospital here in um, Asheville at the, with the farm, and I'm going to reach out to them and talk to them about the app because it'd be really great for them to use that with the patients that are out coming out of outpatient care or into out of care. And yeah, so thank you for all of that. That's just great. I can't wait to share it. And one more thing as we're wrapping up today. If you had an unlimited budget, um, what would you do <laughs> to make the biggest impact right now on the planet? <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, I, selfishly right now is to try to get the word out. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, and unfortunately, that's very expensive to get the word out because, you know, we're, we're up against all the other niche apps out there in the world. Um, mm-hmm. But I really do believe that, that once people are aware that there's a community like this that's focused in this area, I think that that, that that will continue to, to build this tribe. And you know, the other thing that I would say too is that, and we, we didn't really touch on it, but you know, this whole concept of, of offering more clinical care to mm-hmm. folks who need it. You know, and you know, you look at the disease states out there, like uh, alcoholic fatty liver disease, mm-hmm. which is obviously a direct result of alcoholism untreated. And and so, how can we start to look at behavior modification? Plus integrating things like lab results and and scans to you know measure the effect of, you know wh- where we're at baseline in the liver. Mm-hmm. How do we start to look at things like that? You know, and so one of the things that I'm working on the side is, is other ways that might be more specific disease states. Right. You know, if you look at diabetes and you look at hypertension and obesity mm-hmm. and all those, right, those have been done for for quite a few years now, where people are learning that hey, if I offer an app and I have telemedicine and I have mm-hmm. clinicians that are available and peer counts, right. 
where's the addiction piece? Who's focusing on the diseases that are right. directors called hepatitis C, opiate addiction, right? Mm -hmm. Alcoholism. What are the other ones out there? And so again, a lot unlimited funds, you know, you know, it <laughs> would, would be nice to be able to do a lot more around the clinical care piece to treat because not everybody's going to be solved by a community, right? Mm -hmm. Not everyone's going to be solved by tracking the things they need to do every day to stay healthy and in recovery and serve others, right? That's right. a big part of it. There's mm -hmm. no doubt. But in some cases, you're going to need to have clinical involvement. And, and again, right. that takes time, money, and resources. Exactly. Well, I, I totally support that. And Ding, you can have all the unlimited resources you need yes. the app ongoing. So I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that's right. Venture capitalists. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Matt. It's been a joy to have you on the show today and talk about your app and I'll be sure um, all listeners have easy access to that in the show notes. Yeah, I appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. And let's, let's stay in touch too. If there's ever anything I can do on the VA side, I'd love to, to help, you know. I just have, obviously you can tell I have a little passion about, about seeing good, seeing results. And, mm -hmm. and I, I know there's a lot more that we can do with this community.